Deconstruction is not something, this is kind of Socratic. I mean, the idea that you have this knowledge, you do this, right? Your brains do this, this is just critical thinking. So teaching you deconstruction really isn't teaching you an idea, it's really just putting words to something that your brains already do. Give a short summary of what the article is doing, then answer these, kind of reflect on this. What does this show us about the fluidity of history in this RLS? As a teacher in IB, I'm not, my, my job isn't to take knowledge that they don't have and shove it into their brains. Their understanding needs to be brought out of them, and it's my job as a teacher to, to foster an environment that allows the learning to happen. A student who is curious about life in general is step one to becoming an, uh, an IB learner. I'm in the IB program at Central. It's International Baccalaureate, and the main goal of it is instead of having just an academically inclined student to better round everyone. My name is Caitlin Engle, and I'm a junior here at Central. The big desire for the IB program for me was just the teachers. I knew that I had teachers I liked in the IB program, and also I liked the coherent style of the classes. And all your classes are IB, so your teachers all communicate and they work together. It would be morals, values. <laughs> okay, okay, I was focused. I think the biggest like upside is the smaller class sizes, because we've got thirty something kids in my IB class of juniors. So all of my classes are like 10 to 15 people, and I feel like it's just like a family. Specifically, we're required by IB to also consider not just the literature itself, but to consider the cultural and historical implications. Okay, one of those contexts, right, is the culture within the world of the novel. We're thinking about the setting, right? Where's all this playing out? It's during a revolution where? Iran, when? Oh, I was just was gonna talk about, cause she makes a ton of allusions in the book to like Marx and to like. Yeah. Keep, keep, keep those in mind. I think the, the deep themes behind it that she experienced really do, they're universal themes. As I was reading it, I was still wondering like, what happened to six-year-old her? International Baccalaureate is an opportunity for kids to take a different track starting their junior year. And so the kids that have taken honors courses, maybe their freshman, sophomore years, looking for those challenges in the classroom. Um, by the time they get to be juniors, they can, they can choose to go into the AP course track and take the AP courses, or they can do IB, which is, which is different in many ways from AP. With AP, I felt like it was like picking a la carte items off a lunch menu, whereas I felt like the IB program was more cohesive and full. IB wants to help you understand how to get there, so there could be many answers, but they more focus on how to get to the destination rather than where the destination is. She, she made a switch in, in style a little bit. And I teach theory of knowledge, but I like to think that IB in general in, is kind of, we call it TOK, kind of TOK um, bent because we like to learn about knowledge as knowledge. Because she even has like some barriers within her own culture. How does uh, the author use like diction and syntax, how does that come into play along with the rhetorical techniques to create that, that knowledge question? In IB history, you're not just learning the events of history, but you're asking questions about cause and effect. You're asking questions about revision, um, deconstruction. But did you ask the question about syntax? Do you see that word that she used? Embarrassed. Why did she choose the word embarrassed? Who has diction? 
Okay, so I mean, think about that, that choice of words. I have theory of knowledge, seventh period. That's the only true, like, weird course in IB. It's very specialized just for the IB students. Essentially, they take everything you know and reconstruct it in a different way. So you have like a better understanding of the world around you. Cultural aspect of their language, like a lot of like cultures have like different personal connections. Right, we're talking about information versus knowledge, individual versus group. First claim says quality of knowledge is best measured by how many people accept it. Discuss this claim with reference to areas of knowledge. I don't like the word quality because it brings in that inferiority versus superiority with knowledge, and I think that's really, really. Theory of knowledge incorporates aspects of philosophy, but it is not a philosophy course in the sense that we are not studying all of the thinkers, we're not studying philosophical theories, but we will pull them in in an attempt to understand knowledge across all areas of knowledge. And so it's a way for students to understand how that knowledge is developed in people's minds, what aspects were used to create it, to share it, to justify it. Doesn't that mean that aside from their body, a person is just information because you what are you other than the bits that you know plus the bits that you can't share and are you able to justify something if you're not sharing it right or is, can things be justified without sharing them? so it's trying to help them understand that there are different theories and different resources available to them to validate and justify their knowledge and ultimately share it in a way that's meaningful and synthesis being the analysis on a group scale so drawing connections between uh, relational experiences between people. Today, for instance, we just were working the last couple days with revisionist history. And we were looking at Soviet, the Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah, the articles about the, the condemnation about the war in Afghanistan. It's about that and how they're kind of declaring it null and void. And we're and looking that. at how history is being revised by the current administration in Russia. And they're looking at it differently with a less critical lens. And so we start asking questions, and my students got into asking questions about um, why nationalism plays such a prominent role in certain countries, which is a, a really relevant question to be asking today. We're striking those from the records. This was for the glory of Russia and morally acceptable for modern times in the world, right? Yeah. Okay, so what heuristic might come into play when you've got a guy like Putin, who's very well liked by, by a lot of his people? Authority. Yeah. Right, right. This is a seminal work. It spread the seeds of the idea that, you know, we really need to look at how nationalism was not just something that helped cause World War I. Nationalism is the identity around the world in oh so many ways. People, you know, consider how much nationalism rose during the 20th century when in large parts of the world, most of the population couldn't read. I think a do was first. Uh, how would you define history? It's like, we're talking about this in TOK, and it, I'm just interested in what your definition of history is. <laughs> is it, okay, is it like a fluid concept where history can change, or do you believe that it's set dates? The dates are there. It's good to know some of the sequence of events, but the point of history is to learn how to handle all this information you're flooded with, right? So you're trying to find out the validity of information. They're living in an age today that information is a second away, right? They have instant access, they have instant gratification with all the information available on the internet, but they don't often take time to analyze why that information is valuable, how it's valuable, how it's applicable, who's creating it, how are they knowing something is valid knowledge or justified knowledge, and so we try and give them the skills to answer all those questions and ultimately apply that knowledge in a meaningful way. With IB, I have a resume that kind of builds me and could put me in leagues with like Caltech or Georgia Tech, and it kind of puts me on the next level for colleges to look at me. So it kind of broadened my worldview of where I could go and what I could do in the world. The IB program is everything that, um, that we value here at Central. Establishing global-mindedness, um, 
establishing education through action, civic mindedness, um, and helping our students to become reflective, critical thinkers um, and aware of what's going on outside of their small education here. Yeah, just trying to shed a light on what they're actually doing at this point. I hope that IB students come out of the whole process with a sense of perspective that they didn't have going in. If we could, if we could kind of foster that in the in the general um, education environment, um, then we're we're pre better preparing students to participate in our democracy, to participate in in the world as it exists right now. I think one of the biggest problems is the amount of division in society. And where do we change that? It's with young people. So they they need to. They need that, that, that broader sense of perspective that life and everything is, is bigger than just what they've experienced. And I think IB really tries to do that. And if they could bring that to the world, then, then I think IB has done its job. <laughs> After graduation, I would like to do something with engineering. After my IB environmental science class, it's really opened my mind up to what's going on around us. And a lot of these things I didn't realize beforehand. So I would really like to do something with environmental engineering, because I feel like that is the best way that I can improve the world with my tiny footprint. <laughs>